this point in your studies, it's probably a good time to stop and to think a little about the difference between atomism and holism and how that impacts on legal problem solving. The approach that we've taken so far has been what can be broadly described as atomistic. It's about dividing problems into smaller problems and those problems into smaller problems and then solving all those problems independently in the hope that if we solve all the little problems, the big problems will take care of themselves. Now this is part of the whole scientific approach, the Western post-enlightenment mind view, but it does create problems in certain circumstances and it does create some problems for law because sometimes it can railroad you into a perspective that's too narrow reflects only one opinion or only looks at one sort of solution. There's an old adage that if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and this can be the problem in legal problem solving too, is that law is quite often a blunt hammer and doesn't provide a wide range of solutions. I mean, we can punish people, um, but we're not very good at rewarding people in law. We're not very good at creating positive behavior um, we can punish it, we may not be effective at punishing it, but those are the options we tend to have. When dealing with clients, this can also mean chasing a solution or a remedy that's not of benefit to the parties or, or to society because of the mindset that we adopt in this is the legal approach to a problem. We can choose our options too narrowly or too quickly and we can foreclose our options very, very soon and neglect the broader context or overall results. An obvious cost of this in the legal profession is the cost of litigation, and sometimes where a client's interest might be better served by a cheaper, more um, conciliatory option or some other approach rather than litigation, what often happens is that the costs of litigation absorb the, um, uh, the, the, the value of the thing that's being fought over in the first place, a classic example being a will where everyone taking an adversarial stance, enforcing their rights as they see them under that sort of legalistic mind view, means that at the end of the day, the lawyers are the only ones who um, end up making any, getting any money out of the will. And um, Charles Dickens' Bleak House is a famous fictional representation of that idea. So your professional role as a lawyer is always, of course, to, re to represent the interests of your clients or your organisation, or society if you're working in uh, in the regulatory field. And sometimes those other parties or organisations that you deal with are not always able to represent what their interests are in, in, in a straightforward way. Um, with individual clients, often anger, grief, frustration. In organisations, there's often organisational inertia, what we've always done in the past. There's all sorts of factors that will affect the choices that clients make unless they're assisted in thinking more broadly and thinking about the broader picture. And this is where holistic ideas come from. Atomistic is about dividing into parts. Holistic is about understanding interrelated systems as they connect to each other as part of a whole. And the term holistic was um, invented by J.C. Smuts, who said the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And this is the foundation of this idea. Now, it's been very important in other disciplines. In medicine, for instance, in the past, doctors tended to treat the symptoms of an illness rather than looking at the context in which a person lived and the things in their lives that might be making them sick or, or preventing them from getting well that just giving them a whole lot of medication may not help with. In nutrition, for instance, it involved a move away from a focus on you know vitamins and the chemical composition of food and vitamin, su vitamin supplements to having a look at, at a broad contextual idea of diet. And it also it um, is important in the field of environmental studies. And I think possibly the classic example of an atomistic approach or a failure to appreciate the holistic approach would have to be our friend the cane toad. Um, the introduction of prick the prickly pear, uh, ran completely out of control, a moth was introduced to control the, the prickly pear, the moth got out of control, the cane toad was introduced to try to prevent the moth, so on and so forth. I'm not sure what you move up from to, to kill the cane toads, saber-toothed tigers, nuclear bombs, whatever, I don't think anything's going to work. But that's an example of a situation where that atomistic problem-solving approach failed to see the broader systemic implications and the interdependence of those systems. 
So when we're talking about holistic, I mean, there is a tendency to associate it with a sort of a, a new age approach um, and these visions of, you know, using crystals instead of caveats or dream catchers instead of, instead of injunctions. But it's not necessarily connected to that way of seeing things. You will find if you search online for holistic justice or holistic law, an awful lot of discussions around peacemaking uh, as lawyers and, and things that are in that sort of Californian, um, slightly new age or largely new age mindset. And it's easy to dismiss these, I think, uh, out of a sense of professional cynicism. Um, but I do think it's worth looking at some of these other perspectives and thinking for a moment that uh, maybe our own cynicism is informed by some understanding that our, our, our particular hardline legal approach might actually be inadequate. But getting back to the point, holistic, the idea of, of holistic uh, approach to law and legal research doesn't mean a hippie approach. It doesn't mean a new age philosophy. It just means looking at systems in the broader context, understanding how systems work together and solving problems in that broad way. So what are some strategies? What are some ways of, of avoiding thinking in that particular um, uh, atomistic way? One is an interdisciplinary approach and asking on any particular problem, what would someone from a dis different discipline think? What would a doctor think? What would an engineer think? What would an architect think? And keeping that in mind, trying to avoid the, the mental traps of just running down those obvious, obvious legal solutions each time. A way to concretize this, I don't know if concretize is a word, um, I've just used it though, um, is to actually map out your options. I'm a big fan of visualizing the, uh, uh, the process of actually going through and drawing out a, a map where you say, this point, these are the options, these are what they lead to, these are the sub-options. And if you find that your options are reducing as you go and getting more narrower and narrower, that might be a warning sign and that might be an alert to say, we need to do some work on brainstorming and widening our options and looking at things from a different perspective. Another strategy is to enhance your emotional intelligence, which is something which, you know, different people have different abilities with, but you can improve with practice. But when dealing with a client, emotional intelligence, and I guess for an organisation, there is an institutional awareness as well of understanding what it is you're actually being asked to do and not just taking the first surface response and actually digging further underneath and trying to understand the reasons why they might be asking for a particular solution introducing other options, thinking about them, reality testing, saying this is the likely outcome, this is the best possible outcome if you go through a litigation process, this is the best possible outcome if we regulate this heavily, what are our other alternatives? Because sometimes it's not just a matter of simply following instructions as you're given, but actually trying to understand what the, what the needs of that person are. After all, if you've got a client who's suffering from an illness, that's preventing them from actually expressing themselves properly, you want to make sure they've got medical help first before taking what they said on face value. And it's the same with any kind of problem situation. Also, it's important to think about culturally appropriate situations. Our legal system is very much based on a win-lose approach. Now, in some contexts, that might be fine for a small win for a client, but it might result in them being ostracised from the community. They might become a pariah because of the, that. And it's all very well to say, here's a win for justice, You've, they've stopped for their rights. But if that means that they're now longer, they're now disengaged from that community, that can be a problem. And I'm not suggesting here that you should let people, you know, be doormats or be walked over. But you need to consider all these things in context when you're laying out the solutions and helping people or organisations select the most appropriate path. And finally, for the research process, I'd really suggest using a devil's advocate approach. And you can do this yourself, but it can all be most effectively done with a peer, where you can say, have I looked at all the angles? Am I just going down the easiest automatic path? Or should I look at other things? And this is where the last minute cram to, to finish assignments at the last minute does you no favours. 
because you don't have that time for critical reflection of yourself, nor for the time to get feedback from someone else to say, is this the right way to approach that problem? Have I missed something? Are there other opportunities? So there's some, some approaches that you might want to think about. But generally thinking, we are going to be talking in legal research a lot about an atomistic problem-solving approach. It's the way we do things. But always keep that in the back of your mind that you shouldn't let that blind you. You should always think of the big picture and make sure that you balance that atomistic problem-solving approach to always keeping your eye on the bigger picture. Thank you.